Hello, this is Dr. Peth, and welcome to Introducing Social Research. So the main intent of chapter one is to point out similarities and differences between our everyday approaches to learning and the way we learn in social sciences. So this chapter presents you with several examples, some from everyday experience and some that are from published social science research. And that is also the type of research that I conduct. So I, on my webpage, you'll see my publications and you'll see some of the experiments that I conduct as well. And I'll show you that at the end of this video. So most of the examples contain what's known as an if-then comparison. So whether it's implied or explicitly stated, if-then rules propose some uniform expectations so that we can all use our past observations as a guide for the future. So we also introduce this idea of a sticky theory. So sticky because some ideas stick so tightly that no amount of contrary evidence would dissuade people from them. So a lot, would, a lot of individuals would say that that is religion and faith and politics. Those are very sticky theories. And then here we have our sticky notes just to bring this um, home. So now we have a most curious case of missing silver. So the setting is this lovely country mansion, uh, like those that are favored by the rich, you know, the kind that you have a bunch of servants and this immaculate decor and the cabinets are loaded with all types of historical artifacts and beautiful um, arts and paintings. So the owner returned home from a trip to find valuable silver items missing from the cabinet that was in the drawing room. There were no obvious signs of damage to the cabinet. Obviously, the police were called and they conducted a full search of the mansion and the grounds and interviewed all of the staff. They still did not find that missing silver. They did find several intact fingerprints in and around that silver cabinet, but they did not match the prints from any of the household staff, family, or visitors. So the prints, however, did match those of a robber with an extensive prison record. The man had recently been released from prison. Also, a tiny smear of recently fresh blood was found on the cabinet, and it matched the ex-convict's blood type. So the fingerprints and the blood together provided strong evidence of his guilt that the ex-convict might have stolen this missing silver. But did he? So the if-then rules propose uniform expectations so that we can use past observations to guide to our future. So if you can use your past observations to correctly answer the question, if this, then that, then we have the most curious case of our missing silver. True or false? If fingerprints found in a location match the prints of a known person, then that person must have been in that location. So in the comments to this video, please answer number one, true or false, just to show your attendance for the virtual classroom. Two, if fingerprints on an item match the prints of a known person, then that person must have touched that item. Again, true or false, make sure you enter in the comments two, whether you believe it is true or false. So you would have one in your answer and then two in your answer. Another, this should be three, if the suspect drowned himself and also cut off his own hand, then he cut off his hand. What do you think for number three, true or false? We know from our past and our everyday learning that dead people cannot perform any act, right? So such as cutting off your own hand. So the correct answer to number three is obviously true. Hopefully that's what you answered in the comments, but if not, that's okay too. It's all in good learning. So if the suspect drowned himself and cut off his own hand, then he cut off his own hand. So that is true. The reason is clearly the timing, right? You had to cut your hand off and then that could have caused your death and then you died. What? So you want to know what happened first in time. And typically when we're doing research, our timelines are very important. But now what about statements one and two? 
So the answers to both of these statements are false. And hopefully that's what you added in the comments. And you want to look for here to your scientific learning explanations. So now as part of your comments, be sure to provide those science learning explanations. So there is something to be said about the value of skepticism and reserving judgment, even in the face of what seems to be strong evidence. So this is an important lesson when we're trying to solve that case of the missing silver. And that's why we use science learning. So let's move on to our sticky theory. So what does it take to discredit a person's existing beliefs? So if Quinton is a strong supporter of the death penalty, he participated in a psychology experiment. And for the experiment, he read an article containing compelling evidence that the death penalty has almost no deterrent effect. So at the conclusion of the experiment, he supported um, the use of the death penalty to be increased. Now, Jared is on the other end of the spectrum, right? So he is a strong opponent of the death penalty. He also participated in the same experiment and read an article containing compelling evidence that the death penalty deters crime. So at the conclusion of the experiment, his opposition to the death penalty increased. So we have two individuals and they're both going in the opposite directions of the spectrum here in terms of their views on the death penalty. So what do you think is going on here? Again, write that in the comments to our video. So for both of these individuals, Quentin and Jaren, um, they are looking at capital punishment, how it was rated in the study that supported their beliefs as either more convincing or better conducted than the study that had the opposing um, views. So the net effect of reading the two studies was to drive them further apart in the beliefs of their death penalty, right? So they were still at the opposite ends of the spectrum. They still either were a proponent or opponent. They did not change their mind. So do you know anyone whose beliefs appear to fit the idea of a sticky theory, possibly a parent or a sibling or a friend? So maybe you can add those comments in the um, comments of our videos. No one is immune, right? We all have some ideas that seem to stick better to some people than to others. So there are proponents of abortion and those that oppose it. There are proponents and oppositions to gay marriages. So there's a lot of issues that we either agree or disagree. And we have ideas that seem to stick better with each of us. So in science, we have skepticism, which is a strong norm, right? Humans conduct science. So sticky theory creeps in because we are human and we tend to stick to our own beliefs. So here's what we're going to do is size up our everyday learning and our science learning. So all of the examples in our chapter included the case of the missing silver and then the one you just read on capital punishment and sticky theories make comparisons designed to test this if then statement. So the if then comparison implies some idea about a cause and effect relationship. So an important thread that is consistent throughout these examples is the continuity between what you learn every day and science learning, right? So the common thread arises because you either have a lay person or a scientist that look to their experiences to identify rules, such as if I do A, then B will result. So if the rules of cause and effect, um, they provide reliable ways for us to make decisions. So this is the notion of causation. So how does science learning differ from our everyday approach of learning? Not all everyday learning is useless and not all science finds the truth, right? Science does try to extend our everyday learning in vastly important ways. But the line between our science learning and our common sense learning is not always clear. So here, let's look at a familiar example, recipes. 
So science relies on written records. So, and recipes are usually written down, right? So science emphasizes a peer review of research and recipes are passed down from generation to generation. And the peer review process in research is where it's usually double blind, meaning two researchers will look at this um, manuscript or paper and review it for acceptability or publication into the journal. So science uses formal reasoning and recipes are often explicit and relatively precise. So science requires careful me measurement and in most family kitchens, however, there is no explicit measurement of the taste and no one pays any attention to how to measure the outcome. We just want to know, does it taste good? Is it worth cooking, right? Is it worth going through all this effort to make your own homemade loaf of bread, right? Which makes the house smell so delicious. And you have reached the end of our lecture. I look forward to your comments in, um, in our video. Thanks.